Oh, it's recording. <laughs> Thank you, anonymous attendee. And whose mother grew up on a tobacco farm. Fantastic. <laughs> All right, are you ready? I'm ready. Fantastic. All right, welcome everyone to Stratford Hall's third program in our series of Colonial Foodways and Culture in the Atlantic World. I am excited to introduce tonight a colleague of mine who has become a very good friend and supporter of Stratford Hall over the last few years. Um, tonight we'll be talking about, or he'll be talking about, I might chime in a little bit, but the culture of tobacco. So, um, and so far in the series, we had started out with the Colonial Milling, where we had Steve uh, Bayshore and Justin Cherry talk about the mill and different uses of grains during the 18th century. And the last program we had Mr. Dontavius Williams do a fantastic cooking demonstration as he talked about African American foodways. And tonight we have the honor of having Justin Fornell, who is a, an international explorer and um, a fantastic sort of connoisseur of all things cool, as I like to say. Um, I met him, I met you, Justin, through National Geographic four years ago, almost to the day while we were working on a documentary on Nat Turner. Um, we have done a lot of work since then and I respect your work very much Justin. Um, you have a TV show of course uh, on the Science Channel which you can mention in a moment if you'd like and you know a lot of the things that you are interested in and have spent your life exploring and and researching um, we're going to be showcasing some of those things and tonight we'll be talking about tobacco. So again this is the third in a series of programs on colonial foodways and culture. Tonight's program is about the culture of tobacco. So Justin's going to take us on a trip from sort of just like everything from the origins of the tobacco plant to the ways in which it's been used and just even the idea of smoking. So it's going to be a very fun, a very sort of broad, uh, beautiful, textural sort of trip through the culture of tobacco, which is going to be fantastic. And at the end, so his, his talk will be about 40 minutes or so, give or take. Uh, you will not be bored, trust me. I've uh, seen a version of this talk and I was very excited about him doing this for Stratford, so thank you. And he's gonna be talking tonight about the culture of t t uh, tobacco and smoking. So I'm gonna stop talking because nobody's here to see me. But again, we'll have a nice 40 minute lecture or so from Justin, and then we'll open it up to question and answers at the end. And on that note, I'm just gonna pass it on to you. Justin, for now. All right. Would you, would you like me to share my screen? Sure. Get right into lecture. Okay. And this will be. Um, see if this works. How's that? I see the guy. All right. Great. And this is a uh, picture of me from my high school yearbook, <laughs> which you, uh, <laughs> which you you might recognize. And uh, so yeah, tonight we'll talk about really one of my my great passions, which is pipes and tobacco and the, the world of tobacco, the lore of tobacco, and what a strange plant. What an opportunistic weed that has really woven its way into human consciousness for thousands uh, upon thousands of years. And uh, of course, we'll get into a hyper-focus when we get there and talk about some of the Chesapeake uh, Bay pipes, some of the clay pipes of the colonial era. But more than anything, this is really just big, juicy, chunky, funky trip through the history of pipes and tobacco. And uh, so when we start off, really we gotta go all the way back. And we have to go back to what the pipe is as a tool. And, and of course, tonight we're really focusing on, on clays and this being one of the oldest styles of pipes uh, on the planet. And the idea that this is one of the few things you might find on an archeological site that its primary function is pleasure. You know, we find, uh, you know, shovels and, and, and hammers and weaponry, but there's very, and we'll find things for making dinner and food, but you know, this is, is an item that is really unique unto itself, that it's really meant to be filled with something that you're gonna burn. 
and essentially inhale into your body, into your lungs, and exhale. And in some situations, of course, it was just for a quiet moment, an introspective moment to think about your existence, why you're here, what you're doing here. But even more so, uh, as we will see as we go through the history of smoking, a lot of times it's to really reach a higher level of thought, to even commune with the other side, the other world, deities, ancestors, to make an offering, to communicate to those who cannot, we cannot see, those places we cannot physically reach. <clears throat> and so for that, we go to the ancient world and talk about who were really the first smokers. Uh, well, as you know, his historic record shows, Herodotus, who's a great Greek historian, around, you know, for around 485 BC, talks about the Scythians. And these are the great warriors of the, uh, of the steep. And the Scythians were big, heavy smokers. And you can see this, this urn right here would have been filled not with tobacco, but with, with marijuana, with cannabis sativa. And it'll be put on, you know, we're talking about the cold, rugged environment of the steep, and we're warriors, and it's just a hard life. And then late at night, of course, to kind of get escape, Herodotus wrote, they grow drunk with the fumes as the Greeks do with wine. So imagine them around these little urns. So as opposed to just a lot of times the idea that they'd throw, they'd have enough to where you'd throw it on the campfire, you could hold something like this in your hands and put your face in front of it and put a little, a little tent of, of animal hide over your head, to essentially you know, have a little moment with inside this little private tent and you're left alone with the fumes. Um, other items in the ancient world, we think of the Celts. The Celts, we found iron pipes and we assume that they would have smoked various <clears throat> endemic plants of the area, various bushes, things that would have either had a flavor or a stimulation or a feeling when smoking them. And if anyone even goes around a campfire or a smoky kitchen, really any kind of smoke is an experience. So it might be not what we'd have in the psychotropic effects of cannabis or heavier things or even tobacco, but certainly you're going to have an experience from inhaling purposefully, inhaling smoke into your lungs. And so with that, we look at all these other little groups that are kind of all around the world. And we even think of things like frankincense and myrrh. And with that being said, it's a great segue into the ancient American culture of pipes and tobaccos, and that's frankincense and myrrh is being thrown on top of coals. And in a lot of situations like the Oracle of, uh, Oracle of Delphi, this idea that these vapors are envelopes to the gods, and we're sending our questions within these fumes of smoke and hopefully getting a response, getting an answer, or perhaps even getting a favor. So the idea of smoke as offering, and for that, it doesn't need to be cannabis. It doesn't need to be tobacco. It really could be anything that is being burnt <clears throat> as an offering. And so we see that across the world, going back to the beginning, really, of recorded history. Um, and that brings us to America's first tobacco pipes. So we're going back before we know it as classic Native American to these Hopewell cultures, these, these ancient cultures. And these are the oldest pipes that have been found in the Americas. And if you take a look at them, they're just gorgeous. They're just incredibly carved animal pipes. And the opening, if you'll notice, so you see the bowl, then the opening of the pipe is so that you are face to face with essentially what uh, many interpret to be someone's spirit animal, their animal spirit. So in, while inhaling what is it within the bowl, you are staring down and essentially communicating with your spirit animal and in some ways becoming your spirit animal. So that's just showing back that once again, there is this combination of pleasure, ritual, and a sense of trying to reach the other side or a higher level. Uh, so that's just so, I've always been so fascinated by these pipes and I've never gotten to hold one I don't know if you have Kelly or not, but they, uh, or just be up really close and personal with one of these, but they've just been absolutely fascinated me because they are very different from what we're going to see a few hundred years later. Um, <clears throat> which brings us really into, I think, what most, you know, when we think about really the first pipes, what led up to what we're smoking today. Like if I was to sit down with my Meerschaum and we think about the route that tobacco has taken, the journey it's taken, well, that takes us really to the Native American culture and the use of tobacco, the association with tobacco and the rituals. And so one thing that I think is really at the center of it all, and it's a term that's obviously very loosely thrown around, sometimes in an inappropriate manner, but is the idea of a, a treaty pipe or a peace pipe. So of course, tobacco is being smoked to, to make an offering. It's always being offered to the sky first, to the deities, 
and then we're passing it around. It's a communal pipe. And here's a pipe here. Now, it's very similar, you'll see, in terms of materials to the ones you see in the image. This is a calumet, and this is your classic Native American pipe stone pipe. And whereas if you look in the image here, you've got the calumet, you have the bowl, you have this hard, kind of, it's almost, had, it's, no matter how warm it is, this, they always feel cold in my hands. And this is one that I carved myself. And uh, the stone is called Catlinite, named after George Catlin, who was a, a naturalist who went around uh, in the 1800s and lived with all different indigenous tribes and recorded their, uh, their ceremonies, their rituals. And of course, hey, the white guy did it, let's name the stone after him. So here it is. So this is Catlinite, also known as Pipestone. And it comes from a very sacred mine, which is in Pipestone, Missouri. So something I encourage everyone to do when you get off the call tonight, look Pipestone, Missouri. This was a place that was an area that really any indigenous people could go and be at peace. Even if you were at war, when it came to those Pipestone quarries, this was so sacred, it was so special that that area was really a shared space. That was an area, and to this day, if you are not Native American, if you are not allowed to go there and mine. And this piece had to be given to me from someone who had gone there and, and mined it. And they are also technically allowed to sell it on their own. But as someone who's not of a particular Native American group or tribe, it is a very special place and it is exclusive to the Native American people. So this is, like I said, this is your classic, classic, classic. Now, and when not, you're, you're not smoking it, these should always be separate. These should always be not together. When it's not actually functioning, we want to keep these apart. <clears throat> but one thing we'll also go with is that this was not just the only styles. We also have things being made out of really anything you can imagine that you could smoke tobacco out of would be manufactured. Here we have a coyote skull and the bowl. Can you guys see this okay? It's actually a piece of deer antler. And then a tamper, something to tamper with would be actually the coyote's penis bone, the baculum. So it's really absolutely amazing. We will talk about this later. If it can be smoked, it has been smoked. If it can be made into a pipe, it has been made into a pipe. And that's, that also goes for Native American cultures is that there's so many different tobacco traditions that it's been done. And I know that we tend to associate these, what we're looking at on the screen here, this is it. This is the high art, this is the high ritual. But believe me, that as many different indigenous tribes as there were, there were almost as many different tobacco traditions. Uh, we will get into this later, but here's a pipe that often gets forgotten in this discussion. This is a tomahawk pipe. Now this is not, this was made by uh, settlers and tradesmen who are, were coming from Europe and meeting with indigenous people and said, well, what can we do that's really gonna get us some good things? So of course we took a stone tomahawk, made it into a metal tomahawk, and then added a bowl on the top. And this is actually can be smoked through the handle of the tomahawk. So this is a very fascinating tool that, once again, this is not classic indigenous design. This was brought in from outsiders who said, wow, we see a tool that's often, that's used heavily, and we see a tradition that's used heavily, let's combine the two. So that's, once again, a very interesting part of that culture as well, that became part of the culture. And now you'll see these for sale, really at almost all Native American events, they will sell these as kind of a, a wink and a nod to, to history, but it is still a very popular item. So with that also being said, when, when I met with the, uh, at the Apache Reservation a few years ago, I spoke with them and I said, well, what is your, your pipe traditions? And they said, we never had pipe traditions. Said we would take tobacco and roll it in oak leaves. So this was our tradition. He said, any, any pipes that we had were we got through trade, but it was not something that was always part of our history. So it is interesting, once again, to see that tobacco was taken in all different ways, all different styles. And even things such as corn cob pipes. Corn cob pipes go back hundreds, if not thousands of years. They may not be the Missouri, Missouri Mearsons that we look at now. And today, when you go to, you know, to a 7-Eleven or to, you know, a funeral, a um, uh, place that has souvenirs, but Certainly people have been smoking out of corn cobs for hundreds and hundreds of years. And with that being said, let's talk about two tobaccos. Now I know probably most people on this call have experienced tobacco before. You, certainly you've smelled it, certainly you've 
either enjoyed it or not enjoyed it or had a battle with it, tried to get it out of your life. But if we go back a couple hundred years, we really had two tobaccos that were both quite popular in the ancient world and certainly in the Americas amongst indigenous people. So if you look on the left of the screen, we have Nicotiana rustica. And on the right of the screen, we have Nicotiana tobacco. So basically, I want to say 99% of what is available on the market right now is Nicotiana tobacco. This is what we're seeing in cigarettes. This is what we're seeing in cigars, pipe blends. Nicotiana rustica, this is the truly ancient tobacco. And why do I say that? This was the ceremonial tobacco used by the Aztecs. This was something that is, what makes it unique is that it's so much stronger. It has such a higher amount of nicotine and the flavor is a much stronger. It's, if you were to try it, you'd understand, you'd, you'd have a better understanding of why these were rituals, these were ceremonies, because that strong hit of nicotine gives a psychotropic effects. It gives you this kind of really, pardon my French, but it knocks you on your ass. And um, I had always been kind of trying to track one down and you'll see it at certain powwows. They might be offered as, as, a, as a role, as, a, as an offering. And of course you can always track it down, but I was in Tanzania a few years ago and they were growing tobacco and making it into these, these really dank, dense, funky tobacco cakes. And even the smell of this is like, it's just so muddy and dark and, and it's just, it just earthy and funky. And we were on the field and so I decided, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna chew on some of this and you know, just pack some in my lip. And I, I felt like I was gonna fall over and I love pipes, obviously I love cigars and this, it just made me sit right down. And every time I had it after that, I said, did they, lay, did they put something in this? Did they lace this? I put some in my pipe and if you didn't have a full, if you didn't have a full lunch and you smoked a pipe of this, you were just, you're really, really gonna feel it. And then the more research I did, I said, ah, oh. I said, that's the Nicotiana Rustica. And you saw from the experience that this was like no tobacco I had ever had in my life. It, very similar plant, but it's just that heavy amount that, that it's the ceremonial funkiness. And that is absolutely a mind blowing difference in plants. But once again, in the battle of the international tobacco battle, Nicotiana Tobacco is the one that stepped forward. It's the one that has really made the impression on, on human history and been one of the most traded plants uh, and malign plants in, in our history. Uh, but that's not to say by any means that the majority of what indigenous people were smoking was actually tobacco. Uh, what we're looking at here is a very interesting little selection of kinikiniks. And kinikiniks, once again, I'm gonna say this several times in this lecture is that if it can be smoked, it will be smoked. It has been smoked. So you can imagine that just as different uh, indigenous groups around America were eating the plants and animals that were close to them. So folks who might eat porcupine and skunk in one area might be eating otter in another area. Things that today we might be like, oh, no one ever ate that. Someone ate everything and someone smoked everything. And so we're looking at endemic species that were there. And it made it fun to meet folks from different areas when you're trading because a knick said a lot about you, who you were and where you lived. So we're looking at some things on the screen right here. If you see the picture uh, right beneath it, um, that's Mullen. And, and what's interesting too, this is what really fascinates me, uh, Kelly, is that all these plants you see appear later throughout history and they're usually called poor man's tobacco, farmer's tobacco. And these are things that were always smoked and then they would just kind of keep reappearing when people had couldn't get their hands on the real stuff. They found something to smoke. So you see uh, the mullen. Mullen is known very much so as farmer's tobacco. And it's something that is actually in a lot of um, herbal cigarettes now. This is what you'll see. And it's a very strange plant. I've collected some here and made my own knick You can see it never really dries. It's uh, some will call it donkey ear because that ear those leaves are like, it's just like that sweet little silky velvety donkey ear. And even if you leave it to dry, it still remains just this very soft kind of spongy, strange, <laughs> delightful plant, but <laughs> at the same time is, is smoked by many. And it's actually was, it's been prescribed medicinally as to help with asthma. So there's quite a few things that we're going to talk about today as well that 
Some right, some wrong, where tobacco is considered something medicinal and it's considered healthy to inhale it. And so you'll see a lot with some of these plants as well. We see raspberries, uh, blackberries, uh, but it's not the it's the it's the leaves. So if anyone has raspberry bushes growing in your yard, feel free to pick an experiment with those leaves. Uh, down in the lower left there, you have staghorn sumac. And uh, not only can you use those leaves for a smoking blend, but you can also make a drink out of the staghorn sumac. Um, it's, it's actually absolutely delightful and it tastes almost like a, a hibiscus punch. Um, so it's really fascinating. One thing we also mentioned also was, uh, was corn silk. So you can actually smoke corn silk out of a corn cob pipe. And uh, Kelly, there's some really great jazz numbers from the 20s and 30s where people will reference smoking corn silk. That's um, fantastic. So, yeah, and they're just these beautiful kind of big band jazzy numbers just waxing poetic about the wonders of smoking <laughs> corn silk. Uh, and down in the lower right hand corner you have something called rabbit tobacco. So these are all plants that indigenous Americans would have had in their knick-knick, in their pouch. Um, we do have an early, uh, an early thing. What some of once again, when Europeans arrive, one thing that is beneficial is that there's some great journal entries that, whether they're completely honest or not, certainly give us a snapshot from an outsider's perspective of some of the traditions that may have not been written down if they did not come. So here's one um, uh, from 1512. I'm sorry, this is a French explorer, Jacques Cartier, as he ventures into Canada and sees some of the First Nation um, tobacco traditions. And imagine this is something he had never seen before and, and to see it for the first time, that's why I think you might enjoy yeah. it. There groweth a certain kind of herb, where often summer they make great provision for all the year. And first they cause it to be dried in the sun, then wear it around their neck in a little bag. With a hollow piece of stone or wood-like pipe, and he's referring to a musical instrument when he says pipe because we haven't heard of tobacco pipes yet. When they please, they make a powder of it and then put it into one of the ends. And laying a charcoal from the fire, on the end they suck it through a long body and they fill themselves with smoke until the smoke comes out their mouth and nostrils. They say that this does keep them warm in health and in good health. They never go without some of it on them. We ourselves have tried the same smoke, but having in our mouths, it tasted as if it was pepper dust. So you can imagine the first time really <laughs> saying, hey, let me try what you guys got there. And <laughs> To this point in history, no one's, you know, invited you behind school in fifth grade to say, oh, try a cigarette. No, this was, we don't even know what you're doing, you know? So it's really, really just fascinating. And that, um, and one thing I will mention, which I, I definitely don't want to surpass because I have a goodie right here is, it's not only plant products that are being ignited and smoked, it's also animal products as well. Um, probably uh, the one that's made the biggest impression and is still being used is this, which is, uh, beaver's castor gland. So these are beaver casters and these are used, if you smell it, it smells like, like formaldehyde and, and <laughs> leather. It's just such a strange and wonder, wondrous uh, part of the animal that is used in trapping, it's used in perfume, and it is actually FDA approved and used in cigarettes. Uh, people also use it for raspberry flavoring, but it is something, it's so fascinating. You so say raspberry flavor. flavoring? Yeah, yes. So beaver castors <laughs> are used in raspberry flavoring, legally approved by the FDA. So possibly a good portion of us on the call today have either smoked or eaten. For all of us who are at home squirming in our chairs, there's a possibility you have experienced this the last time you made some sort of, you know. Raspberry tart. Tartufo oh. or, or something, yeah. So it's really fascinating and other um, muskrat <laughs> glands, certain animal uh, fats might be, you know, to kind of bond it. So you can imagine that once again, if it can be smoked, it has been smoked. And that's the, the kind of some of the research I've been trying to get more into because there's not too much of a written record of, of the animal parts, but that's been, what I found on that has been really absolutely fascinating. And so with that going into, we have, how does, tobacco get to Europe. So I know we mentioned early on <clears throat> that there were people smoking. <clears throat> we have pictures and images, I'm sorry, we have images and things written about people smoking around the world going back to ancient times, but this was not tobacco. So now we're talking about how does tobacco make its way back to Europe? Well, we're entering into the age of the conquistadors, the age of exploration. 
we're talking about individuals such as Columbus, Cortez, Fernandez, uh, <clears throat> and they all have really some really interesting observations. So once again, as I'm talking about pipe culture, pipe technology of indigenous Americans, we also have tobacco technology and traditions in the Caribbean. And so I'm going to read something actually from uh, Columbus's journal, which I just, I just thought was pretty interesting <clears throat> because we're seeing something else, which you're going to recognize when I talk about it, and it is not tobacco through a pipe. So uh, Christopher Columbus, November 6, 1493, from Cuba. My two messengers reported that they had encountered many men and women carrying some sort of cylinder in which sweet-smelling herbs were glowing. These, they supposed, were dried leaf stalks covered by equally dry by a broader leaf, wrapping it up. The people sucked the other ends, as it were, drank in the smoke. Although this apparently intoxicated them, it also seemed to protect them from fatigue. These natives said what they, these cylinders were called tobaccos. <clears throat> so here we have, for the first time, Europeans seeing cigars. And so where we see a lot of the British traditions of smoke being affected by Native Americans, we see a lot of the Spanish traditions being affected by what was happening in the Caribbean. So it's really just a fascinating beginning to folks reading about this and seeing these traditions for the first time. Um, Herman Cortez, when he went to the court of Montezuma, describes having these, these breakfasts where he was invited to sit down for drinking chocolate, hot chocolate, but of course it would have been spicy and bitter and wonderful. And he'd be instruct, instructed to drink burning leaves through long golden tubes. So once again, something else, a, a, a beautiful Aztec tradition of actually we're burnt, once again, almost thinking a little bit in, in some of the ways the Scythians having the tobacco being burnt in an open container and then we're sucking up the smoke as it's rising. So these are so many things that have been traditions that weren't the thing that caught on. They weren't the cigar, they weren't the pipe. There were different ways of taking in this plant that had been involved in these cultures for hundreds, uh, if not thousands of years. <clears throat> and now we have also, so words getting back, words getting to Europe that there's, what can we make money from? Hey, we didn't send you guys there to have fun. What can we make money from? So we're looking at things like, you know, different textile dyes, uh, chocolate, gold. And of course, what is this plant that everyone is smoking? So Francisco Fernandez uh, in 1568 is sent uh, by Philip II of Spain to mainland, was now mainland Mexico, to find out what, what's going on. What are some of these, these wonders that we're hearing about? And he brings back uh, what is estimated to be the first tobacco plant to Europe. And suddenly it's here. And <laughs> so we have, here he is. Uh, so now we're getting into kind of who are these patron saints of tobacco? So in this era, when we have conquistadors, explorers going out, going to what they're considering a new world to them <clears throat> and finding out what they can take back, certain things are getting popular with different people. Um, but when it comes to tobacco, there's very few who have left a bigger mark than our old friend, Sir Walter Raleigh. Um, <laughs> do you have anything to say about him before I jump in? Or? No, I just, the slide is fantastic. It's such a great picture, and uh, yeah, as you can imagine, with a lot of historical figures, you know, you you know, they all have their own George Washington cherry tree story, and certainly <laughs> Walter has a lot of them, a lot of really wild stories around him and tobacco, and of course, he was overseeing a lot of things that were happening in Jamestown in Virginia, <clears throat> and he was one who was really starting to say, hey, this tobacco thing is, is not only do I think it's going to be a big success for us, but I really love it. And this image right here is one of the famous stories. So we have the gentleman explorer here, Walter reclining in his study with this insanely long pipe, which they might call a yard of clay, because <clears throat> it's an absurdly long. And we're gonna talk about pipe length as well, because length does matter when it comes to pipes, because in this case, the longer the pipe, the less you can do while smoking it. It shows you are, <laughs> an individual, of, not of leisure necessary, but an individual of thought. And the shorter pipes are like, hey, I need my hands. I can't have this thing that's going to fall out of my mouth. So I need this really short cutty pipe, this little nose, this little face warmer. So, but here we have uh, in his study, reclining, writing a treatise, writing, you know, the wonders of tobacco for the queen. <clears throat> and um, his servant comes in and sees the smoke coming out of his mouth. 
and never having imagined that smoke would come from a person's mouth, thinks that he's on fire and dumps a large bucket of water on him. <clears throat> so just as there's, you know, there's so many, one, it's so many beautiful images of, for example, John the Baptist being beheaded, I think there's equal amount images of Sir Walter Raleigh having water <laughs> thrown on him while smoking a pipe. So once again, I think that's a fun take home for everyone to, uh, to track down your favorite uh, Walter image of him getting him taken. I wish I yeah. would have known this before. I could have swapped Stratford out for an image of him getting water thrown on him, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and just keep them rolling. Yeah, exactly. And feel free to recreate this image at home. Oh, I, I think I will, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, of course, he's trying to get everyone excited about tobacco. He presents it to uh, Queen Elizabeth first, and it's something that is, well, once again, we're talking about these gentlemen who thought they were inhaling pepper gas, pepper spray, <laughs> and, uh, and so she started coughing a bit, and his challenger for her, for her feelings, the Earl of Essex, tried to, you know, really convince her that he was attempting to assassinate her, and of course, that did not stick, and once again, this is one of these stories that's I'm sure wrapped half in truth, but I, I, I really enjoy hearing these stories of early tobacco taking <laughs> England by storm and creating controversy everywhere it's <laughs> uh, <laughs> But once again, he is, um, <clears throat> and in 1596, we see the word pipe is for the first time entered in the dictionary, uh, where England had Sir Walter, France had Jean Nico. And this is a very interesting individual where Walter saw tobacco more as an opportunity, as a cash crop, as something for the court, something pleasurable. You know, it's, it's for the explorers, it's for the aristocracy. jean Nico says, this is, I think we might have our next miracle cure here. You know, this might be, uh, this might wipe the pandemic right out. You know, we, we <laughs> so his, he has an obsession. So he's actually was able to get some of the seeds that came back uh, that were given to Philip II when the tobacco plants came back. He is, um, French ambassador to Portugal. He's a slippery fellow. He's an educated fellow. He takes these back, presents them to his queen, and he says, I think we've got something. <clears throat> so if you look at his name, it's going to look familiar. Uh, this is a gentleman who really uh, championed so much the medical uses of tobacco that he is where when the, uh, alkali, when the primary alkali that gives it its potency is, is discovered, it's named after him, and that's nicotine. <clears throat> and also we have both plants are also named after him, Nicotiana tobaccum, Nicotiana rustica. So this is a figure who, you know, it's, it's a little lesser known, but certainly once you start getting into the world of tobacco, he is one who was there at the beginning of its entrance into Europe and really played a key part in, in the ways it was conceived and sometimes clearly misconceived, you know, so it's really just a fascinating uh, character. And, uh, Another fun little read we'll get into right here is, so if we think outside of the, these are the power players. These are the funds, the folks who are saying, hey, you really need to fund these expeditions because look at all these great things we're getting to steal from, from these populations who have been there for thousands of years. But we also have folks who are, who are the ones bringing it back and forth. We have the, the sailors, the seamen, the folks who are on the ships who are bringing back all these, these items, traded items, pillage items, and of course, are always the ones who get to kind of experiment with them first. So even early on, I know we have ideas of sa the sailor with, you know, even like Popeye, the idea of a sailor being a pipe smoker. And this is not without historic basis. Um, here's a really interesting, a quick excerpt from uh, <clears throat> a map maker. His name is uh, Pierre Gringon. He's located in the, uh, the French coastal city of Dieppe, which was a great map making city. And he talks about his first experience seeing a sailor smoking a pipe. This is back uh, in 1525. Yesterday I met an old sailor with whom I took a glass of Breton wine. While drinking, he suddenly brought out of his bag a white object, which I thought first was a schoolboy's writing instrument. One, one that had a bit of an inkwell with a long pipe attached and he had a small wallet. He filled the large end with some brown leaves which he had crushed in the hollow of his hand, applied fire to it with an ember, and a moment later, having put the pipe between his lips, he puffed out the smoke from his mouth, which astonished me. He told me that the Portuguese had taught him this and that he had learned it from the Mexican Indians. He called it Petinure and said it had inspired him and given him pleasant thoughts. 
So I, I just, I mean, I just absolutely love these. These are the first impressions of something that we- So fantastic. We just take for granted. We'd say, oh, look at this person buying some, you know, so American spirits at the gas station, it's just <laughs> second nature. But there was a time when this was fantastical, outrageous, bizarre. And I just, it's just so amazing how far tobacco has come. And it makes me think of the images that you see so differently too. And even as an archeologist, I've dug, you know, thousands of pipes all over the place. And it's just a very different idea that I'm getting from your talk of, as you said, like sort of the fantastical. So keep going, I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> well, thank, no, so that's, that, that, yeah, we're going to definitely, we're going to get heavy into that too, obviously, um, with all the pipes and why there's pipes everywhere. Uh, but so here we are, this is my, one of my favorite slides of the night, and if you can't read it, it says, more fun with tobacco. So here we have jean Nicot's work has really taken off. He's just been <laughs> stomping, banging on doors around Europe and saying, this is it, this is the miracle cure, so you see pieces like this, uh, medical books you see to the left, which describe tobacco as all the wondrous ways it can be utilized. And it doesn't talk just about inhaling it, but also talks about taking the wet leaves, making a poultice on injuries. So tobacco is really this wonder plant. And, and some folks in England are really using it for the beauty of, it, of the flower. So it's making its way around, it's, it's gaining popularity, it's becoming more accessible to folks. And, uh, but in this world, it's really, we're seeing what the medical applications are. And two things you see here, on the top you see a tobacco enema. And the idea was put forth, and this was going into, God forbid, this was going into the 1800s, that if you were to blow smoke up someone's ass, and that's where the term comes from, it might revive them if they fell into the water, if they were freezing, if they were drowning, and that the power of the tobacco, of the smoke, would kind of wake them up, you know? And so the best is to go through Obviously, if they're out, you could blow it up their nose, but I mean, you could have made, you know, it's such an outrageous scene. And these were, these kits were, were put along by welfare associations along the Thames River. So if someone had fallen in, you can imagine, as opposed to like, oh, let's get them something warm to drink. They're like, no, get around, get around. Let's rip their clothes off and, and blow smoke up their ass. It's such an absurd notion. Thank you so much for giving me a history of that term. I think we all are better for it. <laughs> I think, yeah, absolutely. And the fact that this picture exists is really, and... And just the way they're all really committed to the moment, you know, is, is just absolutely, it's, it's outrageous, it's fascinating, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's kind of wonderful, and I hope that that person was okay. Um, <laughs> and then so for all my macabre friends who are tuning in, uh, we have what's beneath is the plague pipe. And if you noticed with a few of those talks I was, the things that, the, what the readings I was talking about earlier is this idea that folks are surrounded in smoke and it's keeping them lively, it's keeping them clean, it's keeping them healthy. Well, there was that very much that the smoke, the smell of the smoke, if you think about it, you know, I think of like my grandfather who used to smoke a pipe uh, and, and introduced me to it. You know, it's kind of like you'd smoke the pipe to keep the mosquitoes away. And so if you think about mosquitoes representing pestilence, you think about them representing sickness and everything that goes with that, we have the idea of the plague pipe. And we think about the 1665 outbreak uh, and people would smoke pipes. And it's like, oh, you better get yourself a pipe, better get some tobacco and you're just protecting yourself. Yellow fever outbreaks, people are smoking pipes to protect themselves with this cloud of smoke. Um, and then folks who are assigned to do the berries, these mass burials, these, these grave diggers would have pipes. They would have these plague pipes with them to kind of say, look, I got to make an honest dollar, but at the same time, I want to get home tonight. And so I'm going to take my plague pipe with me and protect myself from the pestilence. And not even that, but the bad energies, the negative energies. And, um, I know we'll get into questions later, but certainly the spiritual elements of tobacco definitely move from indigenous Americans and are taken into Europe and work their way into multiple, multiple cultural traditions, certainly into witchcraft, certainly into a lot of other things we're going to discuss. <clears throat> and now, so we say, all right, where's all this tobacco coming from? Where's it all coming from? Well. Look at this map, this is 1685, but we're gonna be talking about a period quite a bit earlier. We're talking about Jamestown, uh, Virginia, uh, 1607. Um, it, uh, it was founded in 1607. In 1619, the first ship of enslaved individuals, uh, 20 enslaved individuals, uh, the white lion comes from uh, carrying individuals from Angola. So now we have three classes of folks here. We have uh, these European settlers, 
we have enslaved Africans, and we have uh, Native Americans. <clears throat> and all these, uh, there's a lot of activity happening. And they're trying to figure out, uh, Jamestown's really trying to figure out what the hell are we going to do? What are we making? And they're trying, trying uh, historic records shows they try a lot of different things, glass making, making silk, uh, nothing's really taking off. And what's interesting too is that the tobacco coming from Virginia at the time is considered crap. The Virginia tobacco is considered crap. The good tobacco is coming from the Caribbean. The Spanish have it. So, which it's just that which is a really interesting situation is is they can't seem to get their game started. So enter a man named James Rolfe, and you may recognize his name as he went on to marry Pocahontas, and they went to England in front of the court. So James Rolfe gets to James uh, to Jamestown, no no relation, uh, sixteen ten. And he's trying to figure out what the hell he's going to do. His wife dies when he gets there. Um, and, but he was able to steal some of these Caribbean seeds from the Spanish. And there's all different theories that, you know, perhaps Pocahontas had something to do with helping him get the seeds. But he gets these seeds and he plants this tobacco. And now they've got Virginia has the good tobacco. So in 1617, they're exporting 20,000 pounds of tobacco. Following years, we're going up to 40,000 pounds of tobacco. So it's absolutely, you're seeing a success story happen. And then you're seeing how tobacco goes from becoming something that wasn't doing very well to where they got the right seed, they got the right crop, and now is, is currency. So there's a period of time, and I know, Kelly, you can jump into this uh, if you care to, but period of time when tobacco is money. And certainly uh, folks working for the church uh, were being paid in tobacco. And if there was, there was a particular situation where if there was a bad crop or a bad year, you can imagine. We're, folks are expecting 40,000 pounds of tobacco to come. It's like a bad wine year. It's like, oh, did you have the 86? They only made, they only got 200 bottles. So of course it's gonna skyrocket. The value of that, that crop is so much that people would prefer to pay you in currency as opposed to paying you in tobacco when the tobacco was really, really valuable. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a really fascinating time in, in, in history. And we're suddenly, we're starting to see what we're gonna talk about, which is these Chesapeake pipes. And what's also really cool is that we're also seeing pipes, there's been evidence that pipes were being made in this time period out of clay, also in Mali and Ghana. So we have these traditions that are circulating uh, with the trade. We've got tobacco making its way around. And of course, folks are using local materials, local clays to produce ways to smoke them. Um, and what's interesting as well is the size of the bowl is really going to depend on where you are. So if you're someplace really a far flung part of the empire and, but the tobacco is coming all the way from the Virginia, it is a luxury of all luxuries. Uh, but if you're right where the crop is, once again, you think about the indigenous people of, of Cuba, <laughs> they're smoking giant cigars because it's their <laughs> crop. They have endless supply so they can enjoy it to the absolute utmost. So when we look at a lot of the clays of the time, you can even, once again, Virginia, we're looking mainly at this beautiful red clay. Well, why don't we get into that? These pipes are beautiful to look at. Oh, let's come back to the hogshead. Think about some of these pipes, this beautiful red clay. And once again, if we're close to the crop, we have a big bowl. And uh, this is, this little nipple here is, we're holding some of the earlier ones that you'll see. Uh, you can see that they're flat on the bottom. That would be called a sitter. Uh, later, these would be called, when they're made out of wood, they're called billiard pipes or poker pipes because you can essentially be playing a game of poker or playing billiards and you just rest it and it's going to sit there where something like this, it's, you, you're, you're giving your full attention because certainly you got something to hold on to, but if you put it down, it's going to roll over, ashes might fall out. Um, but if you have a look here, some of these beautiful little pipes, these beautiful red clay, and you see some of the detailed work. Uh, some of this is some of this rouletting that's going on here. And we have, think about like a small toothed wheel. And that's just helping us make these really beautiful, intricate designs. And I know, Kelly, I believe you mentioned some of this is certainly being inspired by African images, African traditions coming over. Is that the pipe you're sharing right yeah, now? Yeah, so <clears throat> these are actually from Stratford Hall. 
Fantastic. They're from the earlier, and I'm sorry, you can't see my face, but if you look up where my face is supposed to be, you'll see some pipe bowl fragments from the Cliffs Plantation that was about 1640s to 50s. And these are representative of the enslaved Africans that were on site there, and they would take the local clay, they would mold these pipes, as Justin's talking about, and they would take tools, as you see, and on some of the ones on his slides, and they would actually um, inscribe certain ethnic marks into them and certain patterns that reminded them of home, and they would trade these pipes as well so once they you know I know Justin you're going to be talking in a little bit about the ones that came from you know uh, the Dutch pipes and the English pipes that were sort of white clay and more sort of you know molded but these handmade pipes um, in this area a lot of them were being made on these plantations for trade because tobacco was so plentiful and the, again like you see the the different designs would be etched into them yeah they're just just gorgeous and and when you see these in person there's just and we also have a few different techniques. So we have where we have the, the little rollers. We have certainly, you can see some of there, some of these stamps, and you're just indenting them into the clay before baking it. Uh, we have cording where you can probably, that top one might even be some cording where you might take a, a little braided piece of metal and wrap it around there and just kind of twist it to make an impression. So there's all these techniques that are being used to make these pipes really unique. Um, once again, most of the ones that would have been the Chesapeake pipes are made of this Virginia red clay. Uh, some of the ones I know that were at Stratford Hall were identified as being British pipes because they were the white clay. Uh, and certainly there's been examples that combine the two where you'd have this red pipe and then you might have a person's face almost like a silhouette made out of white clay and pressed onto the red clay. Unfortunately, when those are usually found, there's a little bit left, but certainly the, you know, the delicate uh, piece that was added on uh, has, been, has been rubbed away over time. Uh, but think about these pipes. Oh, you're starting with a pipe like this, and it's long. And as you're smoking it, you know, you might bite it. It's, it's, they're still very, especially these are the handmade ones. They're very brittle. They're very delicate. And you're working, you're smoking. You drop it once, this thing's cracked into pieces. So <laughs> there's broken pipes. There's broken pipe stems everywhere. And as you go, it's going to, you know, we're talking about tobacco. We're talking about your saliva. We're talking about all these things mixing things are going to get a little funky. And so, of course, when this is getting dark and blackened, you want to keep your bowl, you want to keep smoking, but you're going to keep breaking, 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 breaking. So if you see a lot of what we see that's left of pipes at the end are, are quite short, and we'll get into these pipes in a minute, um, it's because people had smoked them to the end. And <clears throat> but that doesn't mean you couldn't continue to smoke what was remaining. And uh, here's a very interesting piece that Kelly uh, brought forward. And I'd love for you to just talk about this because you were, uh, this is from your collection. Yeah, no, definitely. So that is a um, English pipe that was found in a 1770s slave quarter. And what he's showing you is the very end, right? Just the bowl. So that had probably, you know, in our own sort of theorizing, at some point, you know, it was part of the planter class. They were smoking it. It whittled down to that little bit that's left. And then at that point, it would have been handed off to an enslaved person. Um, and what you see in a lot of slave quarters, uh, you'll see a lot of those sort of just the bowl, sort of the, the, the cigarette butt right of the pipe um, being handed down after the use by the planter family and you see a lot of those really yeah really fascinating and and now before we talk about these pipes here because they're all really fascinating pipes with really interesting stories now with the tobacco becoming popular pipe makers are, are coming from everywhere we have uh, pipe makers coming into Jamestown to work there to live there we have tons of tobacco going back and forth uh, it's a cottage industry in England where men, women, and children are making pipes by hand. And then, of course, people start using molds and they're getting just, it becomes an industry. Uh, a lot of people are smoking pipes. A lot of people are dropping pipes. A lot of people are losing pipes, breaking pipes. And so, and the clay is of the earth. The clay is baked. And so these are things that survive hundreds of years. And I know you and, and so many folks that you worked with, it's something that you really find. It's one of the most found items on an archaeological dig in. Within the yeah, oh, 
Easily, easily. And you can data site too really quickly. And you were talking earlier about the size of the bowl for the handmade stuff, but the size of the actual bore of the pipe or the smoke goes through. You also see a correlation between the availability of tobacco and the, the hole actually getting bigger. So even if you don't have a bowl, you'll find some cigarette but or like, you know, the, the pipe stem pieces and you'll be able to actually look at the hole size and tell what date the site is. So it's a really fantastic way of dating a site. And that's only for the ones that were either done or English, not the homemade ones that were made in Virginia. Got it, got it. And, and one thing I did read is uh, with some of these points being made, if they're single points, uh, it is suspected that uh, shark teeth were used as, as one of the tools to actually decorate the pipe, which I thought was... I like you have shark's like teeth that. at Stratford. So. Yeah, that's what I said, things that are yeah. washing up on the Potomac, absolutely. <laughs> um, so it just in terms of pipe culture, the world of pipe smoking, so once again, all of a sudden across Europe, we've got chocolate houses, we've got place where people drink chocolate, place where people are drinking tea. We have place where people always are drinking ale, but suddenly pipes become a thing to do and get together. Once it before, you know, for a time it was this, it was like these forbidden spices. It was, it was like cardamom. It was something that was only for the rich, but now that it's becoming more popular, it's getting to the working class and people are going out to, after a hard day work, to have ale and smoke a pipe. But once again, if we look at, uh, you know, we think of like a, a hard briar wood pipe, something I could stick in my pocket and go on my travels and come back and it'll still be one piece. You're certainly, there's a good chance that if you had a few drinks on your way home, you're going to fall off your horse and, and break your clay. So these are so delicate that in, uh, in Holland, they actually have contests going back, uh, I think within the last 100 years, where folks would have ice skating contests and sew these onto their sweater and you have to skate across a lake and the most graceful skater would not crack any of the stems. So it's just showing you the, the you know, how delicate these are. Um, so folks would actually take their favorite pipe and bring it to their favorite inn and leave it there. And it'd be like checking your jacket, but it would be there. And so you'd show up and it'd be like, hey, Justin, how you doing? And they just, you know, all of a sudden you walk in, somebody gives you a pipe, you sit down, next thing you know, you got an A on your hand and it's, you know, the quintessential where everybody knows your name, but it's where everyone knows your pipe. And so this was a thing for, for many years. And that's really where a lot of the pipe clubs started was people getting together to smoke pipes and they'd have a place where they'd meet and they'd leave their pipes in place because the clay is such a delicate pipe. But you'd also have folks who couldn't really afford a pipe or maybe you don't smoke all the time, you could rent a pipe. So all these pubs, all these taverns would have pipes that would be rentables. And that's once again, where we're seeing things broken in. So we've got a, a toothless sailor, sailor coming in who's having a big plate of mutton you know, he messes up the whole mouthpiece. So of course, after he leaves, he makes sure he's caught. And we're like, oh, we know he's getting that. Snap off the end and you'd put the pipe in the oven and bake off his germs essentially. So that was a way of kind of getting the pipe nice and ready for the next customer. We just break the tip <laughs> off and put it in the oven, cook off his- Mutton breath. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you're and we're ready for action. Um, <clears throat> but so as the pipe industry grows, the clay industry grows, we see basically any event could be immortalized on a pipe. These are things we can, we have a lot of pipe makers. We have a lot of creative pipe makers. So we have um, a few different images here. We have the Queen of England being immortalized on her, her golden jubilee or 50 year okay. reign. Uh, even though she was not a smoker, here she is immortalized on a pipe. And that certainly would have been a pipe to get. Uh, we have an enslaved uh, African man who would have been picking the tobacco. And this was a pipe from England in England that someone would have been smoking and really it's really a, a kind of a ironic and sad image of this pipe of here's this individual uh, who's made this experience possible and far away uh, and you're enjoying this tobacco essentially. So I saw this one really was just was so striking I thought was and also a bit strange that that would have been something of the time. Uh, but then up in the left hand corner we have an abolition pipe. So we have on one side of the pipe we have an enslaved individual and on the other side we have uh, Lady Liberty. So these would have been pipes to let people know that you are here to, to help abolish uh, slavery. So it's really wow. interesting that it could be everything from a political <clears throat> figure to a sad, you know, really a, a caricature to a political movement. A pipe was a way of telling people who you were and, and what you represented. Um, and so many pipes, there'll be so many pipes that are, we'll never know, that are lost to history. It's, I, re, I was reading about wrestling matches. I mean, we think of the WWF, but 
of course, there was wrestling going back hundreds of years, and there would be one wrestler, famous wrestler on one side, one on the other, and they had this big match coming up, so you had to get the pipe. So, you know, that to me is just it, absolutely, once again, these little <laughs> history that are just, just mouthwatering, really, you know. It's fantastic. <clears throat> so once again, we see the industry getting mm -hmm. bigger. We see more elaborate designs, and you see these molds. So there's the mold, and you can see some of the decorations, really beautiful uh, decorate. Like I said, we think of what's interesting, and that's what I love about this topic is, I just feel like everyone thinks this is the clay pipe. This is it. This is the same pipe we've had for the past, you know, couple hundred years, but the variations were absolutely endless, and they were thought-provoking, and they were beautiful, and they were interesting, and and it's uh, it's really just, it's an endless rabbit hole, so I'm warning anyone that, you know, <laughs> hold into it. <clears throat> so with that, it kind of, uh, and this is, this is fun, we mentioned this earlier, <clears throat> the idea of these indigenous traditions, and certainly I do believe people were smoking whatever they could get their hands on wherever they were throughout history, um, whether they were just throwing something on the fire in the home, in the hearth, uh, whether they were inhaling fumes from, from boiling something. But here we have uh, the idea of the Sunday backy. Um, if it can be smoked, it will be smoked. So <clears throat> we have tobacco, people have access to tobacco, people have access to pipes, but there's a lot of other stuff out there to smoke. And the idea of backy, backy being like a dirty blend. And when you think of this really shamanistic interpretation of Santa Claus, if we go back hundreds of years, <laughs> the Santa Claus of old was, was a wild man. He was a wild man of the forest. He was a shaman. He was always had a pipe and he had you know, lots of references to, to pagan beliefs, to witchcraft, to, to psychotropic plants, which makes it a really fascinating character. And, you know, and of course he has a big smile on his face, but we have this idea of the Sunday backy. So this is a very strong blend that think about a farmer, countryside in Europe has tobacco, but also had all these other plants such as cannabis, henbane, veronica, and they're making something unique. I mean, it's, we've seen, and I know you and I have spoken about this, about some of the, we'll talk in another series about some of the liquors of Stratford, the drinks of Stratford. There's so many beverages that you have to explain what they are because they just, people don't drink them anymore. Uh, so certainly there's a long period of history when people are smoking tobacco, but they're mixing it with all kinds of plants that are around them. And so I feel the, the Sunday backy is the uh, European equivalent to the Kinnikinnik, you know, and that's <laughs> really just fascinating and, and just how over the course of time people have tried different things, whether it was for flavor, whether it was for effect, but certainly after church on a Sunday, you did not smoke your regular tobacco because that was it. It was your time to sit back on the porch and smoke the strongest thing you could find. And of course, there's evidence of opium resin and other things being involved in some of these blends as well. Really, whatever folks could get their hands on for a special Sunday experience, this was where it all went. Um, <clears throat> and so the clay rains, the clay rains for many years, tobacco rains, and there's certainly a lot more to say to it, but where have clay is gone? I know that some of you are sitting at home scratching your head with all this rich history. Why isn't everyone smoking a clay? Well, why isn't everyone smoking a pipe? Um, other materials come in. Pipes make their way, and I could talk an entirely separate lecture on the history of pipes around the world, of how tobacco and vessel, tobacco and vessel evolve and are absorbed and interpreted by different cultures all over the planet. Um, but three of the big players, three of the key players, um, if you look to the right, we have Meerschaum. So Meerschaum is a Germanic word meaning uh, sea foam. And Meerschaum is a mineral known as sepiolite which came to, to Hungary uh, via Turkey. It's, it's mined to this day in a place called Eskishir, Turkey. And it's this very light, I've got quite a few of these. These are the ones you've seen, uh, a lot of things being carved, very intricate, uh, very beautiful. It's a very cool smoke. They're far more durable than the clay. Uh, and in the 1700s going forward, this became the pipe making material for the next couple hundreds of years. It was beautiful. It was considered exotic. It aged with time. If you look at, uh, here's one I bought my senior year of high school. And here's one that I bought for my grandfather just a few years ago. And you can see that the more you smoke it, the more it changes. So th this is a pipe that ages very well, as, as do the clays. Um, you have porcelain, which became very big in, in Germany when they said, wow, we can actually recreate this beautiful 
T-ware that we're seeing come out of China, we could actually make it. So when that happened, they said, what else can we make? So uh, during this time period in German history, anything that could be made of porcelain was made of porcelain. And the porcelain pipe is a terrible pipe really to smoke because it doesn't breathe. All these other things absorb the liquid and breathe where porcelain is just becomes a bit of a soupy mess, but damn, they're gorgeous to look at. Um, and of course, hold the test of time as well. And finally, if you look to the left, you see the briar. Uh, the trusty briar is really the, will be the pipe making material of today, tomorrow, forever, because it's uh, a dense wood. It's uh, from the root ball, um, the burl of the white heather tree. It smokes cool. It's almost unbreakable. Uh, they're beautiful grains of wood. And, uh, and if you see the stems here, these are loose side stems, plastic stems, where our, our dear old friend, the trusty old clay, it's, it's brittle, it's tough on the teeth. And, and given you, as we talked about the history of the clay, certainly when we had the Chesapeake pipes, they were a little, they were a little knobby, you know, it was certainly rough. And once we got into those molds, certainly they're much smoother, they're much more refined, but you can't compete with, with pipe making technology. And, uh, and that's why really the, the clay did kind of take a back seat in history. However, it's never over. It's never over. And uh, <clears throat> but before we get to where the clay is today, let's talk a little bit about Stratford Hall. Um, and for those who, who are new viewers, please, Kelly, would you just tell folks just a little bit about where Stratford Hall is and why it's of such historic importance? Yes, no, absolutely. So um, this is hosted by Stratford Hall. This is Stratford Hall behind me. Stratford Hall is a Georgian style manor house built in 1738. It was first um, established by, <clears throat> excuse me, Thomas Lee, and it was the home of the Lees of Virginia, uh, four generations of the of, of, of Lees of Virginia. And it's a fantastic plantation museum. I am highly biased. It's on the Potomac River and the Lees during the 18th century, even before and after, but really during the 18th century were one of the most prominent families in Virginia. So they were one of the wealthiest families and they had a gigantic tobacco plantation. Um, they made a lot of wealth off of enslaved labor and tobacco. And um, again, I'll just go ahead and say this is Stratford Hall. If you have not been there, you should visit. It's a very, very important place in history. Architecturally, it's important. The Lees, again, were very, very influential in the building of this, this country. And uh, one of the really fun connections that we found at Stratford Hall was, <laughs> was this pamphlet uh, you see to the right. So we have um, Charles Corder of Cleve, um, speaking about some of the things that were in the house and that really the Lees were not big smokers. And you see this pamphlet here from 1604. This was actually on display in the home. And it was, it was written at uh, King James Counterblast against the use of that noxious weed tobacco adorned the old Lee library in its high salon. So Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee probably did not smoke and evidently tried to discourage others from doing so by hanging this counterblast on the wall. So we think about our old friend, Sir Walter Raleigh. He's really trying to get everybody to love tobacco. But uh, King James I comes to power, and, and he hates tobacco. He thinks it's a terrible idea. He thinks it's, a, it's just a big hot mess. So he publishes this. He doesn't do it under his own name, but everybody knows. You know, word gets around fast. The king's writing a pamphlet. You know, you might want to <laughs> knock it Watch out. Watch out. <laughs> So I'll just read you a quick excerpt of what, uh, what the Lees had hanging this, a, a, a little nugget of what King James wrote that the Lees felt so impelled to post, to have this displayed on their wall, which is to me a very, probably the world's first very cleverly done non-smoking sign. <laughs> <clears throat> and this is from King James. In your abuse thereof, sinning against God, harming yourself both in persons and goods, by the custom thereof, making yourselves to be wondered at all, by all foreign civil nations and by all strangers that come among you to be scorned or contemned, a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs, and in the black stinking fume thereof, nearest resembling the horrible Stygian smoke of the pit that is bottomless. I love it. Yeah. That's how I feel about cigarettes. So that was fantastic. <laughs> That's how I feel about cigarettes. If I'm meeting someone, well, now not anymore, but you know, if you meet someone for breakfast and you're having eggs at a diner and they're just smoking and blowing smoke <laughs> on your eggs, <laughs> you needed that excerpt. Like, what the hell's the matter with you? 
take that back to the bottomless pit. So yeah, absolutely. So with that being said, that's one of the really cool, and there's, and there's tons of great connections with Stratford and tobacco. And uh, oh, one thing I do want to, I'm sorry, we did skip over this, but the hogshead uh, riding on a gravy train with tobacco wheels. So we're thinking, wow, there's tons and tons of tobacco that's, that's being shipped, that's being sent, and it's, it's feeding the nation, it's feeding people. And how's it being transported? So we have this idea of a hogshead, this giant barrel that you would, so if you see uh, in the lower left, this tobacco has already been cured. So you can see behind me on the wall, this is tobacco is being cured right now. It's dry, it's hanging, it's drying. Uh, it's one of the ways- That's the cure. stuff from Stratford, yes. Yep, this is from Stratford Hall. Yep, I saw some there and I said, let me dry this out for the lecture. Um, and it, it'll hang here for another few weeks. Also, um, I'll probably put it outside. You do want wind to be on it. It's in my office now, but if there's a little wind, it's gonna give a bit of a, a better curing. So after it's done, we're gonna stack, stack, stack a thousand pounds of this tobacco in this barrel. Then we're gonna close it up and drive a metal spike through the middle. And if you can see in that lower picture, it becomes its own wheel, it becomes its own cart. And I know this is done with other materials as well, but I just, I just love it. It's just absolutely wild and outrageous and, and ingenuitive as well that this is the way that the, the hogshead of tobacco come down the road and it's, it's all good, there's no waste. It's just things being pulled along. So with that being said, What's left of the clay? Where can the clay be found? Where can the, well, really, where does the clay still get its respect? And I know that's what you're all sitting there wondering tonight. All this rich history, and it's like, can someone still go someplace and sit down and have a clay in the way it's meant to be experienced? Well, a place called King Steakhouse, established in 1885, and it has much uh, farther back roots. It broke away from a few different uh, Irish acting clubs, had a long history. And this was one of the places where they had a great uh, a pipe club and fantastic food, fantastic ales, and it's right in midtown Manhattan. This is one of my favorite places in the world to go. Uh, I went there recently when we wrapped our, our show, which we'll, we'll mention a little later, Unexplained, Unexplored. This was when I got home, I said, I'm going there and I'm going to have a piece of mutton and I want to smoke a clay <laughs> pipe. So and they check your pipe and put it in the oven afterwards. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Wash it up, burn off the mutton. So <laughs> yeah, one thing I will say, if you look in the lower corner, I felt compelled to show this because it's the two go hand in hand, but that's a center, uh, mutton center cut chop. And that's what they're known for. And it's a very- They actually unusual. still make that and sell it there? This is the reason you go there. This is what they make. And I called ahead and I said, I'm not coming there if you know how the mutton chop. That's their, that's the thing is, is that mutton chop. And it's, once again, something, it's a piece of, it's a cut of meat from another time. And they really honor that. And of course they honor the clay pipe. So on their wall, they have, on their ceiling, they have 90, thousand clay pipes on display wow thousand clay pipes it's the largest collective of clay pipes in the world in one location um and just to show you going back over the last hundred years or so they have theodore roosevelt's pipe they have babe ruth's pipe general MacArthur. anyone who was anyone had a pipe at Keynes. and so and to this day if oh, cool. folks don't come in they actually have folks autograph a pipe and hang it up on the wall a uh, good friend of mine richard garriott lives down the street he bought a few hundred pipes from them and whenever you visit his house he carried on the tradition you have to smoke a church warden uh and then you sign it and he puts it on his wall so it's it's really <laughs> a beautiful tradition it's an interesting tradition and it's it's a beckon back to when the clay was king it was the king of pipes and it and it showed really this idea of tobacco making its way around the world and even the clay itself being a creation of indigenous native american people and making its way and, and sharing this idea of this, this article of pleasure, this absolute article of pleasure. So when, uh, certainly when, and, and one, one thing I should tell you is that you will have to smoke outside. <laughs> I went there and I said, is that where the smoke <laughs> room? Like, well, as you all know, some places were grandfathered in, but uh, there's very few places in New York that you can actually smoke. And last time I was at Keene's, the few times I've been to Keene's, you, you cannot smoke in the restaurant, but you can certainly buy a clay and smoke it right outside after you have your your delicious mutton shop. Your mutton. <laughs> um, but everyone on this call, you know, hopefully we will be uh, past this pandemic soon. And I invite you all to meet with me and, and have a drink at Keem's and, and uh, wax poetic about the old but ancient world and, and hopefully <laughs> enjoy a great clay together. Thank you so much. That sounds fantastic. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Justin. That mutton chop, though, is is really it's getting it's me. I'm not out. a big smoker, so for me, I'm <laughs> seeing that, and I'm like, that's, well, that's, that's my vice. For those, right the, for those who have endured this lecture, I said, let me give them something else. So for all the vegan non-smokers out there, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i post something wonderful for you. Uh, no, it's fantastic. So I stop love sharing to... screen and get back to just our... Yeah, yeah, we can just start chatting it up here, I think. I think that's safe. Oh, there, I'm big now. Oh, Scary. Oh. <laughs> no, that was fascinating. And, um, and I just... It's, it's one of those things you think about history very sort of uh, flat, right? And I'm a professor as well. And so when I teach my history courses and when I give tours of Stratford Hall... Um, and lectures online, I like to fill in the sort of boring, you know, timeline narratives with these sort of textures, right? Mm -hmm. Part of this, this program is really, this program in particular in this series, is to add some color and some texture to all of these things that we think about. Everyone has heard, you know, Sir Walter Raleigh's name. Nobody, I don't think I knew even this, like most people don't realize that, you know, he sort of had this wonderful sort of tale attached to him and these funny <laughs> images and just thinking about you know, what, like, what is material culture, right? Like what role material culture has to people then and people now and how you can connect with the past through liking similar things like pipes or foodways or whatever it might be. So it's, it's, this is another sort of layer of that textural history that I really absolutely love to share myself and to share with people um, and the public that are here listening to your talk. So thank you. It was, that was fantastic. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Um, one before any of that. Hold on. Oh boy, here come the questions. Okay, um, real quick. Stratford Hall is open Wednesdays through Sunday from right now before we change to winter hours um, from 10 to 4. And we have social distancing, everything in place. Very safe space. Um, now back to Justin. Somebody asked, actually Deborah asked, Deborah Palmer asked what your necklace is made out of. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't actually know. No, these are, uh, <laughs> <laughs> these, this is a necklace of cowrie shells that I, I got when I was in Uganda uh, two years ago. And <clears throat> as you can see, the cowrie shell has many significance with many different cultures around the world, seen as a third eye, as um, other body parts as well, something of fertility or protection or safety, but it was, it was a gift to me from some friends in the city of Masaka. And Masaka is a beautiful city of really incredible textile traditions. It's where they make uh, Ugandan bark cloth. But this is a yeah, cowrie shell necklace. Thank you for asking. Fantastic. Cynthia Miller, um, it seems like you're a, an interpreter, um, and she asks, hello, what is the difference between a cheroot, is that how you pronounce it, a cigar and a cigarette? Um, I think cheroot is the longer and thinner one uh, than the others. I read a lot of 18th century and Regency fiction and cheroots. I need to know about cheroots. The name is cool in itself. Cheroots are mentioned in the latter. I also write and I, oh, I'm sorry, you're a writer. Excuse me. I also write and I want my character in 18th century Virginia, but from the Dutch Republic to smoke a cheroot. Mm. I do not know if a cheroot is a term um, and is a thing were smoked yeah. in, say, 1781 Virginia. So what do you know about cheroots chir well, there, so there's Justin? Two, there's two cheroots. So there would be a cheroot that would be made of tobacco. So it'd be a long, slender, uh, very thin cigar. And one of the most beautiful things, and I wish I had one, but uh, I'm going to type budget. <laughs> but I'm shopping around for one, is, uh, and I should have had an image of one. So here, have here a Meerschaum pipe, and this is meant to hold tobacco. And your character might love this. There's also Meerschaum cheroot holders, and they're so unusual because it's not like a cigarette holder. It's shaped very much like a pipe bowl, but it's a tiny bowl that you would stick the cheroot in. So the cheroot is at an angle. It's at an up angle, and some of these will be almost identical to this. They would just be really small, and it might be coming out of a person's mouth or the front of their head or it might be a horse wrapped around it. So there are shrewd holders that, um, depending on how late we're talking about, I would see when Meerschaum Sepulite would have first made it, but that would really be something with so much character to it, is these Meerschaum shrewd holders. Certainly, uh, forgive me for saying so, but you could definitely find a lot to buy, if not just look at on eBay to get an idea of what I'm talking about. And some of them will sell for like $10 and they're close. Some of them might be 100 years old. So it's a really interesting item. The other cheroot, the, what I think is the most fascinating cheroot, is, uh, is a smokable, it's like a small cigar from Burma, from, from Burma, northern Thailand, and it's made of a completely different plant. Uh, a good friend of mine, Ray, 
travels there quite often and always brings me back a bundle of cheroots. And this is something that is really uh, smoked a lot by women and made by women and smoked by women. It's such, uh, it's even been called uh, a facial feature in some cultures. It's like without a, sh a green and it's, it's green. So you can see where this tobacco is still green. These are like green cigars and they taste completely different than tobacco. It's a very green grassy flavor. It's uh, very much if you've heard of like a beedi, a beedi is also made uh -huh. uh, coming from India and that's made from a different plant as well. So we're seeing smoking traditions that uh, are not involved in tobacco. So my, what my plan, it's funny that you mentioned it, is I want to get a Burmese cheroot and smoke it out of a, a Meerschaum cheroot holder. And that's kind of <laughs> a combination that I don't think has really been, uh, has really been done too often. But <laughs> you can question. start a new trend. Great question. Fantastic question. See, Deborah Palmer asks, oops, I just lost you. Hold on, here we go. I found a clay pipe with a stem on western shore of Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. So would this be from the 1770s? I, I would I have think, to see a picture of it, but go ahead. Yeah, I think, yeah, we, like I said, I know myself and I'm sure Kelly, we are, any questions that we can't answer, I'm very happy to admit the limit of my knowledge, but I will find out. Uh, yeah, and the picture would be ideal. So that, yeah. that area too the, of the Chesapeake Bay, actually my ancestors were just across from the, uh, Stratford on the Potomac on the Maryland side. And I mean, they were settling there in the 1640s and 50s. So, you know, I'd love to see the pipe. So send it, email me, um, kdeets at stratfordhall.org. I can put you in touch with Justin. All right, next question is, sorry, my dog is barking and this is horrible time. <laughs> Uh, let me see here. The initial Jamestown tobacco was North Rustica, question mark. That I do believe, yes. And I was trying to find the exact things. That's definitely what I'm assuming was the situation. Um, if not, I mean, so if we think of the, um, the Koshian tobacco, it's always the same plant. And when people are talking about, oh, this is a great Cuban cigar, this is a great Dominican cigar, it's always the same plant. It's a different cultivar. So it's also really, it's that terroir and how that's affecting the flavor of the tobacco. And we didn't talk much about this, but some of the finest tobacco is gonna come from Connecticut, uh, Connecticut shade tobacco. And then we see the Connecticut shade tobacco is now in Dominican Republic. So we see these cultivars are going back and forth over centuries. And depending on it, you know, what tobacco farmers you speak with, how many generations it's going to remain really what it was. Uh, one tobacco that this reminds me very much of is Perique. Perique is, considered the rarest tobacco in the world and is only grown in St. James Parish, Louisiana. And it's, it's a really funky, marshy plant that's adapted to that. And then it's put in whiskey barrels. And I have Perique seeds and they didn't even grow up here, you know? And uh, even the farmer said, look, you can take these, I want you to have them. But within a few generations, it's just gonna really revert back to being New York tobacco, Connecticut shade tobacco because of the terroir. Um, so I'll do more research on that, and uh, just I don't I don't want to give a hundred percent answer on on that whether it was rustica or whether it was tobacco, but that's what seems to make sense. But it could also have just been a bad strain that was growing in Virginia, a bad cultivar that was nothing compared to what they were doing in the Caribbean. Yeah, it was funny too because I you know having worked at Jamestown and worked in Virginia for so long and you know studying colonial history I had always just sort of thought of Virginia tobacco as being the best of the best you know because we sort of navel gaze a lot um, in Virginia about how wonderful things are and the history is so great and then in getting actually ready for your talk I was doing some reading as well and there's so many funny primary source like you know uh, comments about like how horrible the tobacco was it was like don't go there you know like the York River is okay but you know god forbid you go up the Potomac and getting any of that stuff you know you can't sell it at all it's it's hilarious so okay Scott Frampton asks Justin what is your favorite cigar and pipe tobacco well, I love um whenever I make a blend of pipe tobacco you know I really love I just really love smoky things I love barbecue and I just I like strong as we always joke I love strong <laughs> dirty flavors you know fishy, it's a good funky stuff things. yes yeah <laughs> and uh, one tobacco that did not come up in this conversation is Latakia and Latakia is uh, a tobacco was made famous out of the Syrian port of, of Latakia and it was something that was smoked over it was cured over open fires of pine cypress myrtle trees uh, legend has it that it was originally smoked over camel dung that was used as fuel and in its, to this day, obviously, it's now predominantly made in Cyprus in the same style. 
um, and that's some of the best tobacco in the world, but it's very smoky. And so I'll, I'll make what they would call like a, an Oxford blend, a British blend, which is not gonna have any of the cherries or vanillas or those sweet casings on it. It's gonna be things that are all, um, even some are called Orientals, these different tobaccos, and they're all just cured in different ways. So you get all these really wild flavors. The Perique, you use a very small amount because it is like, you know, like pepper mixed with grape jelly. The Syrian Latakia is going to give you all that smoke like you're in a barbecue. Um, one that I made recently, this is tobacco. When I was in Rwanda, we came to a big tobacco market and it was this tobacco and I wanted to experiment. So I took some, uh, some friend of mine who will get this, this Jamaican tobacco and they'll roll it with other things. They call it red herring. And they're like, oh, it's, it's this fish tobacco. And I said, fish tobacco. And I, remember, I bought some, they sell one leaf at a time at like little bodegas in the Bronx. And I got one, I said, geez, it smells like smoked trout. So when I had a lot of this Rwandan tobacco. Like trout? Yeah, smoked fish. Like, like fish. Oh, yeah, yeah, or like red herring or red herring. So okay, I took yeah. some dried herrings and I chopped them up and I put them in this tobacco <laughs> for months in a bag. Of course you did. <laughs> and it's, it's just so crazy. It's just like this smoky, briny, oceanic stuff. So once again, just like teas and other spices and such, the tobacco is a sponge. It's going like a Puchong tea. If you put jasmine petals, you don't even need the jasmine petals in the tea. The, the tea is going to absorb that flavor, that aroma. Same with the tobacco. So this is, is one of my fun tobaccos I made, which is uh, my, my red herring Rwandan. <laughs> Your fishy tobacco. My uh, fishy tobacco. <laughs> Fantastic. It's a right, I hope like the grandfather with like the the tobacco that everyone wants to cuddle, crowd around and say, "Who's yeah. that smoking that, that what sweet that pipe? <laughs> like, who's that horrible creature over there in the shadows with that fish tobacco?" <laughs> so I hope Scott that answered your question. Um, Cynthia Miller asked, "Did planters like George Washington who try to grow tobacco ever smoke his own tobacco?" There's another question about Washington down here about sort of why his efforts to grow tobacco failed. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if Washington smoked. Do you know? I have no I idea. Don't know him and I wish, yeah, I wish that, that would have been a great, I'm sure we could find out pretty easily. And I'm assuming yeah. that unless he was against smoking, that he did smoke his tobacco. Or at least chewed it. Cause I feel like a yeah. lot of people of the period too, if they weren't smoking it, they were at least <laughs> chewing on something. Yeah. A lot yeah. of the and probate inventory showed these little sort of spit boxes for the tobacco yeah. and so you know there was probably some sort of tobacco burning around him at some point um as far as why his crops failed um you know it's one of those things too i'm not sure i don't know the history of mount vernon very well and i should but i don't i know the history of their enslaved chef caesar or not caesar that's ours um Hercule, Hercule, yes, Hercules. Oh my goodness. Sorry. Everyone's like blending and all these different yeah. talks are colliding right now but um i don't know why his his crops failed. I know tobacco kills the soil and I know mm. that they found out very quickly as the the settlement sort of started to sort of move west. Um, they had to move west because the the land was sort of dying. So tobacco literally sucks the nutrients out of the the ground. So someone like Thomas Jefferson was obsessed with crop rotations and that was a way that he sort of successfully dealt with the tobacco drain on the soil. But tobacco is really, really hard on soil. So I can imagine that if your soil wasn't good to begin with, with, or maybe you didn't get good seeds, who knows? Um, the climate might have not been that perfect right there. But as you said, Cynthia, you know, a lot of the other plantations around were successful in that. So I'm not really sure why. But I know as an archaeologist, I have um, excavated, and this is a different topic entirely, but I've excavated a lot of burials. And acidic soil will eat the bones of people. And you'll literally be, I mean, one burial next to another burial, you will have a difference in soil so much that one person's body has totally preserved and the other one is gone except for the teeth. So if the, the you know, the acidity in the soil is that different, even a space that small, I can imagine that possibly the land, the actual earth where Mount Vernon was, might have also had some similar issues. But again, I'm guessing, um, that's as good as we can get. And she also said, thank you for answering the Sharut question. So. Sure. And one thing I will add about that is, uh, and we didn't really have time to work it into the lecture, but also with chewing and smoking, we also have the rise of snuff. And in the 1660s, nasal snuff is another reason that for at least for a period of time, pipes stopped ruling the world. Nasal snuff was something very subtle. It was, you have these beautiful, and I'm sure I have a few here, these beautiful little snuff bottles you could keep in your, in your waistcoat, a lady could carry them in her muff, whatever it was. And it's really the quietest, 
way you could just quietly be seeing the, the symphony or whatever it was and just have a quick pinch of snuff and still have the benefits without smelling like smoke, spitting on people, making a big mess. You know, uh, many have said that snuff was, is, is really the, the most genteel way of experiencing tobacco. And it is one of the other methods that we see very uh, infrequently in, in this day and age, at least, at least in, in America, certainly. We got another one from Scott. Uh, where can I buy good clay? Good I guess, clay. are you well, talking about making it? Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I mean, funny enough, you can certainly buy it at any of the colonial gift shops. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a really, it's, it's a great question because I want to look into who's really doing maybe small market, really beautiful, interesting clays in this day and age. This is mainly what you're going to see is um, certainly any of the places you might visit. Obviously, you could call Keens, they'll ship them to you. They were getting something like 50,000 at their heyday, 50,000 made in Holland a year sent to uh, to New York to the restaurant. So certainly that's a location you can get a good clay and it's, 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 you know, their name is in the box. It's coming from a really classic place with a great story. So yeah, that's, that was the place I would recommend if I find something more interesting. I certainly, I want to start producing some small clays, just single one offs or two offs or just for, just to experiment with it. It's, it's, it's clay. I mean, we, you know, we take pottery classes, can make these beautiful mugs and do all these other things, but you know, there's not too many people who are making pipes at home. And I think that'd be a fun thing to do. Tommy Dempsey asks, do you have any info on Pamplin pipes? P Pamplin? Pamplin pipes. Pamplin types. I don't. I don't. Sounds like I'm you're going to have to email. Yeah, Justin. please do. I'm sure we could, we could track that down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, here's one funny thing. My friend Kelfire just picked this up for me. And when I first saw it, I thought it was a clay mold to make a clay pipe. But, uh, and it very much looks like one, but it's actually a chocolate mold to make a chocolate pipe. So <laughs> it's not as sturdy as a clay mold would be for the pressure and everything and, and for the baking, but certainly you can make an adorable little chocolate pipe. <laughs> That's fantastic. Let's see here. John asks, John Bushman asks, Kelly, when can we, oh, this sounds fantastic. When can we expect Stratford Hall to sponsor a clay pipe and brandy evening? Jesus. Yeah, that sounds like next time Justin comes to visit, but for the public, you know, what a fantastic idea. I think I'm going to have to think about idea. that because I feel like that would be a moneymaker. So if this COVID thing can hurry up and go away, um, let's start planning that. I love it. Thank you, John. What a great idea. Let's see here. Judy asks, were the locally made pipes made for export to England or just for local use? They were absolutely used for uh, local use. I do not know of a lot of records of them making their way back across the Atlantic. Um, I imagine some did. I, mean, I imagine some of those sailors Justin talked about probably had some that they loved that they got from mm. someone local. Um, there was a man named, it was Robert Cotton, um, yep. that was his name, at Jamestown, Cotton, yeah. and his pipes became really well known. I mean, they looked, you know, as fancy as you get making local stuff. They had beautiful stamped diamonds in them and everything, and his pipes became pretty popular, but the ones that we were showing earlier, the sort of more you know, earthen red ones um, were definitely smaller. They weren't longer. They were sort of treasured, you know, bits that people kept near to them. Do you want to add anything to that, Justin? No, that's really, yeah, was Robert Cotton. And, and <clears throat> I said that so many were, but as we both know, tons were coming from England. Tons mm -hmm. of pipes were making their way here from England, but I don't think it's too much records of the pipes from Chesapeake pipes making their way back. Let's see, Shirley asks, at what age did a young Native American begin smoking? I don't know that answer. It's a great question, um, but you know, that'll take some further research, yeah. So yeah, email sure me, we a... will look into, and depending too on the different, you know, group, right. I mean, it's, it's the varieties are vast. Um, Dontavius, um, our dear friend Dontavius, says, not a question, but thank you for speaking about the work of enslaved Africans who toiled the fields to grow this cash crop. Absolutely. Uh, we would not have an America without the forced labor of enslaved Africans. We would not have this tobacco culture that grew out of their labor. Um, we would not have the wealth, and Stratford Hall wouldn't be there if it wasn't a plantation that relied on enslaved labor. So absolutely. And you know, it's, it's very important to always be reminded that the labor that was put into all of this, the building of America, these building blocks was all done by forced labor of, of enslaved African and African Americans. So thank you, Dontavius, so much. And I um, saw his talk, he did a fantastic talk. Um, I just want to tell him I enjoyed that very much. I was tuning in, so thank you for tuning in uh, to mine as well. 
No, fantastic. Um, he says, maybe get a close up of the pipe found at Stratford, please. You mean the ones here? Oh, this will watch this. Hold on. Watch this. You about to be in pipe world? I'm just going to just cut my face out for a minute so you can see it. There you go. Um, you can see them right there and they've got the little, I mean, who knows if they were using a shark's tooth. Now I'm wondering, but you've got the little designs in there. This is a photograph that was in, <clears throat> that was taken uh, by our curator, Amy Connolly. Big shout out to her. And it was in a National Geographic article I wrote about the 1619 um, group of enslaved Africans that were brought over. But mm -hmm. we have an exhibit that we're working on right now. And I encourage all of you to come out um, in late November. And it's going, it's all, it's actually, it's a sort of, uh, textural sort of in-person version of all these talks and we're, we have a lot of these artifacts on display including these particular pipes as well as a phenomenal tortoise shell pipe that we have that is most most likely from North Africa and then all the you know we have Robert Cotton pipes and we've got a bunch of cool stuff so come on out and see that so there's your close-up let me put my face back on there sorry Dontavious <laughs> all right here we go um somebody else Carrie asked more about uh Pamplin pipes, so Pamplin, Virginia. We're gonna, okay. I'm gonna look into this. I think this is a Absolutely. thing, so thank you for pointing that out. We're certain, Cynthia asks, were certain brands or types of tobacco considered a sign of status or plantations from where the tobacco is sold? Absolutely, and, and that's one thing with the Perique. Uh, so funny we talked about that, Perique being this rare uh, tobacco that was originally uh, cultivar um, created with the, the Choctaw indigenous people in where around New Orleans, around that area. <clears throat> and once again, it was very special tobacco. It was very different tobacco. And that was, I've only found it written a few places, but it was said that that was the greatest snuff of the Victorian age was this Perique tobacco <laughs> because it was so unique and so different and so hard to get, you know? And that all really goes back to the idea of, as, as we were talking about earlier, the idea of if you're far away from the tobacco, you've got a tiny little bowl. So to have a tobacco from a very special place from far away, of course, would be such a luxury. We got a wonderful link to a slideshow on Pamplin Pipes here. We'll have it recorded in the thing. So thank you, Anonymous, for sending that. Let's see here. Douglas asks, uh, let's see here. Clay pipes are available from reenactor vendors like Samson Historical and James Townsend. James Townsend stuff is so great. And Sons, uh, many of us that are reenactors get them there. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for that information. Because, you know, they are hard to find regularly. I got a stash yeah. of them at an antique store once and they must have just you know, had some Boy Scouts just like run around in a line of them or something at some point. Cynthia Miller asked, did certain pipes or the insides of these pipes work differently in terms of any filtering or some of the harmful effects of tobacco? Meaning when people inhale, did some pipes absorb some of the worst material elements tobacco within the, <clears throat> within the pipe first? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I'd say about, um, and this really kind of goes back to the size of the pipe as well. So if we think about uh, the length of a pipe and we think about the distance really we are inhaling something that's on fire you're inhaling smoke you're inhaling heat so the longer the stem the cooler the smoke is by the time it gets to your mouth so it's going to have less of a harmful effect in terms of burning your mouth um, once again in the bigger the bowl the more body you're going to say it's going to have and the same goes in terms of for cigars if you have a really long what they'd call churchill really long fat cigar, it's gonna, funny enough, it's gonna be a cooler smoke, even though it's a huge cigar because there's all that is a filter to cool down the, tobacco, the, the heat, the smoke before it gets to your mouth. And then you see something once we get um, to Persia and other areas, we see the invention of the water pipe and that in itself, once again, is another filter. We're actually pulling it all the way from the top down into the going underwater and pulling the vapors. So that also is, and a lot of these ideas are just, at this time, it's not really about health. It's about coolness of smoke and making it taste better and be more pleasant. It isn't until a little bit later, once tobacco is identified as being a carcinogenic and being something uh, very dangerous when used over long periods of time, that we do have a lot of pipes like these. Um, we'll have actually spaces in the stem for pipe filters that kind of go between the shank and the stem. Um, Eric Nording, who's a great pipe maker, has these pipe stones. He swears by, he sells them, and you like drop these stones into the bottom and they actually work as like a, a filter as well. So yeah, there's all different kinds of ways that over history once, you know, how do you make a better mousetrap? How do you make a safer tobacco product? Um, 
And things like mullen, for example, the idea was that mullen is the opposite of tobacco. It's good for your lungs. And don't, don't quote me on that medically, but these are things that were meant to be breathed in as things that were good for clearing up bronchitis or whatever it was. Even after tobacco was identified as being something dangerous, a lot of these plants were still being put forward as being healthy to smoke. Tom asks, would you consider doing a lecture on Civil War pipes and tobacco? That sounds fantastic. Civil War pipes are insane. <laughs> they are so elaborate. I mean, the big faces and yeah. I, yeah, I dug um, the officer's quarter at the Presidio in San Francisco. I did a dig out there years ago and we found so many Civil War pipes and like, they just kept popping up. It was the bowls with this like big bearded men and just fantastic stuff. We've got Grant, you know, general, I'm just fantastic yeah. stuff. So I, that needs to happen, Justin. Are you I'm down to, to do, do this? That, yeah. Okay, so at this this round of of uh, programming has been sponsored by Mars and Virginia Humanities, and at the end of our run of programs here, we're hoping to do more in the spring. This has been a very successful series, and I think that that, that topic would be fantastic. So thank you, Tom Dempsey, for that. And thank Carolyn you to both Bean, those institutions yes. for sponsoring these talks very much. Seriously, no. One thing fantastic. I will say, just in case we forget, if anyone has. Questions that don't get answered if you're too shy or just want to get in contact. The best way to get me is really on Instagram. If you follow me on Instagram, it's at Justin underscore for now. You can always ask a question beneath this topic or uh, message me directly. But that's really the quickest, best way to, to engage. And, and also, Kelly and I both are loving hearing your guys' ideas for future projects and events because we're always Great. Around. No, it's fantastic. So Tom asked, oh, that was you, sorry. Where did, okay, Carolyn asks, where did pipe bowls with wine develop? You mean like smoking together? Is that? Pipe bowls with wine. Pipe bowls. I don't know, Carolyn, can you chime in here and clarify? I don't want to mess up your, don't want to mess it up. I'll give you a second to, to clarify that. Douglas says, I experimented with growing tobacco in Ohio. That's fascinating and did well. However, however I'm glad I can speak tonight. However, do you, how do you get the tobacco to get the cherry or apple smell in the smoke? Sure. So a lot of the things that you're going to buy that are those tobaccos have artificial casings on them. So really, obviously, there's a natural way to do things, <clears throat> but all those have artificial flavored casings. And that's why <clears throat> even new pipe smokers, especially younger folks, are very tempted to get the thing that smells really good. And the problem is that there's sugars in there that burn really hot. So you could burn, you can really hurt your pipe, you can really hurt your mouth, as opposed to something like a lot of key. It might smell harsh and strong and like, whoa, but funny enough, the better the tobacco smells, usually the harsher it's gonna be because it has more sugar in it. Uh, but there are ways to do things naturally. So if we think about uh, the shisha, we think about these tobaccos of the Middle East, of uh, Persia, the Middle East, <clears throat> we're taking, tobacco leaves, we're taking something like a shmirna, which is like a base leaf that we use for Latakia. We're adding all kinds of dried fruits. We're adding whatever it is, dried strawberries, dried apple. We're actually physically adding the fruits. We're mashing it up and then we're really sticking it together with things like molasses or honey. So yes, it's the interesting thing about these tobaccos is they're not going to stay lit. That's why if you notice when you're smoking hookah, you have a charcoal on top because it has to have a constant source of fire. You can't put hookah tobacco in a pipe and light it, it's just not going to, it's wet. It's just like, you know, it's like preserves almost. So that is one way to do it, is maybe take your tobacco, make shisha tobacco and, and try doing it with, with the charcoal on top of it. And, you know, the smell of burning fruit is delightful. And some of them are, as we're talking, you know, it might not be related to that wine question, but some of the ways that people make their homemade shisha is they will take wine as opposed to molasses and they'll soak the tobacco leaves in wine, maybe mix it with honey and then make the shisha tobacco with that. So there's all kinds of possibilities. Folks will take the water out of the hookah pipe and fill that with wine. So instead of pulling it through water, you're actually pulling it through wine. So all these different levels where you can kind of please your senses or entice your senses or make it more interesting. Uh, some of my friends from Lebanon will put lemons and ice in the water. So it's like citrus and it's very mm -hmm. cold. So I said, it's really, the tobacco, the pot, it's like people who, you know, making cocktails. 
Yeah, all of these rituals, you know, again, I'm not a smoker, so this is just, it's very, very, it's, yeah, it's very interesting. Okay, so Carolyn clarified, she said, my husband inherited a porcelain pipe from a Germanic gentleman who brought it from Europe to put wine with tobacco in the bowl. So that's what she was talking about. So it sounded like you just sort of touched on that a little bit. Cynthia Miller, oh, go ahead, sorry, go for it. So, so not too many people love porcelain pipes, but certainly, uh, Germany does. Germany does, and they were given like World War One. If you served in the military, you received a porcelain pipe with, with the arms out. So here's a this style porcelain pipe, and I have the stem over there somewhere. It just fell out. So you have this bowl here, and this is once again an additional area to cool it off. But you can put wine in here, and once again, it's kind of that same idea of we're pulling it through just a little bit of wine, but it's just all these different rituals that may be hyper-local. They may be only within one individual cultural microcosm that, or they might've had their heyday. You know, I know one thing that was really interesting that was you guys sent over about the Lees and snuff was they said the best way to bring life back to dried out tobacco snuff was to add a little bit of black coffee to it. Oh, wow. And that was just like a footnote within the, within the Stratford Hall history. So you see it's, yeah. it's like anything else. It's these little recipes and uh, if it can be smoked, it has been smoked. And there's hundreds of different ways I'm sure people have utilized these pipes. And, and that sounds like sounds like one of them. Definitely. Yeah, Jeff uh, Brooks added to this topic before we get to the other questions. It's similar to a Navy flake where it's preserved with rum. That sounds fantastic. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. That sounds really great. Thank you, Jeff, for that. Um, Cynthia Miller asks, when tobacco was planted at plantations, was there a certain area in those plantations? plantings were done. I mean, did it have to be in an area all on its own and not near any other type of plant? I think it probably would have grabbed nutrients, as you mentioned earlier, from other types of plant. And how far away from the house would it have been? So, I mean, I can go ahead and tackle this one. Um, through my work on plantations, through the last 20 years, um, most of the, pl- the tobacco sort of uh, areas and plots were not right up against the main house. So the main house was really sort of a stage for guests. It wasn't really an area where you're going to have crops or of pushing up against it and from what I can tell too at least in the earlier periods and you know think about it too until enslaved Africans were brought here to to cultivate and grow and ship this tobacco it was grown in small plots you know um, nomadic people would have it I mean it's just one of those things where you didn't need to have acres and acres and acres of tobacco it was really only when these planters came over and started this sort of new economy that it turned into this massive production and I think that they ran into a lot of issues and I don't think any of them quite knew what they were getting into honestly Um, I don't know if you want to add anything else but no, that's yeah I mean that's absolutely yeah so thank you Cynthia Trevor Laurie not a question but a comment and I love this I read it earlier I feel like grabbing a frame that I have made out of this um, but I grew up in North Carolina's tobacco belt and I still love the smell of cured tobacco and it's funny I love that smell too I just don't like the smell of cigarettes it seems that many people do too as reci- recycled tobacco barn wood is now in high demand as building material both oh. for the color and the scent absolutely I have a frame um, it's a picture of my dad from like the 1970s and it's it's these really reused tobacco barn wood and it has this like beautiful I mean it's a tobacco smell it's like this wood mixed with like leather I mean it's just fantastic and when I you know when you walk I mean anybody that's traveled anywhere in the south these old abandoned tobacco barns are everywhere the south does not tear down buildings which I love so you know me and my local exploration I'll always get out and go poke around and you know escape the snakes but go in there and I love smelling two things I love smelling smoke houses because you can still smell that cured meat and I love smelling a tobacco barn because there's something that is so sensory about the experience it's just it like takes you right back in time so do you want to add anything to that justin no, that's, yeah no, it, it, i really just want yeah, to great. take apart an old tobacco barn and put it in my office. right i know <laughs> I it's, somehow I figure out a way to, to use that amazing, wood there's some Absolutely. amazing fragrances in here from all the things, but yes it couldn't help hurt to have a few more uh, tobacco boards <laughs> absolutely let's see here is that it hold on i think I think that is the end of the questions here. Hold on one second. Let me just clear these out so I make sure I don't miss anybody. Oh no, see, I knew there was another one. There's more, okay, here they are. Cynthia, she's our good questioner tonight. To which bugs, insects, are tobacco plants more, oh, tobacco bugs, most susceptible? I remember (laughs) seeing an outlander 
I haven't watched Outlander. My colleagues are addicted to the show. I don't know if any of you has, have seen a tobacco worm, but one of the jobs that enslaved children had to do in the field was to pick those worms off. I had always imagined what they might look like because I've seen a million worms and I saw my first one recently and I literally felt like my nightmares were going to be of tobacco worms for the rest of my life. So do yourself a favor and um, Google it and scream. So you really Justin. Didn't like, so you don't think they're adorable like green gummy worms? <laughs> You're we're talking like it's like the hook, the green hook. Yeah. No. It look, it, to me, it looks actually like nature's gummy worm. And I wanted to make, I wanted to dehydrate them and make it because you could, yeah, I figured you could eat it and it would have this, it would be kind of a fun after dinner minute, like a, a smoking event. Yes, so. totally. Justin, we'll have that at the brandy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whoever wins the raffle gets to eat the gummy uh, tobacco worm. But yeah, so there, it's, it's a big worm. It's a green worm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it makes me, yeah. Oof. Okay. What were the various ways that you could cure tobacco? Well, certainly uh, smoke, you know, doing it over smoke, uh, making it into cakes, putting it in barrels. Uh, one, once again, Perique is one of the more unique ones where you're doing it under high pressure in these huge barrels so that it's almost like, um, like pemmican. If we think about uh, Native American, these kind of compact, almost like power bars where you're taking uh, dried powdered meat and berries and animal fat and pressing it under, under all this pressure for a long period of time and making it fuse. That's essentially how the perique is made. It's being pressed so hard that the juice is coming out of the leaves and it's fermenting under pressure in its own juices. And that's completely changing the flavor and the dynamic. There's some great, great videos of folks making perique and taking it out of the barrels. And uh, I've been down there to St. James Parish. And when they open the barrel, it's just these long, like it, it's obviously it's the same leaf, but it looks like it's just dripping in molasses. And that's really just, the fermented tobacco juice, and maybe a little bit of the whiskey that was left in the barrel from earlier usage. Um, but yeah, there's so many different ways to, to really cure sun-dried. Uh, with a lot of cigars, they have these VSGs, these virgin sun-grown. So it's not only what happens after you pick it, it happens while it's growing. We're virgin sun-grown, we're seeing leaves that are under high amounts of sun. We've got Madura leaves that are left to really wither on the plant, as opposed to picking them when they're green. They almost get rotten on the bush and that's a totally different uh, experience. You've got the shade grown tobaccos of Connecticut to where as opposed to exposing it to the sun we're protecting it from the sun so it's very delicate it makes a great visual wrapper for when wrapping cigars because it's just this very light creamy color. So yeah it's, it's both what happens while it's growing and after it's picked can all affect those flavors. <clears throat> John says, turkeys love tobacco hornworms. These worms need to get their way out of this place. I'm going to have nightmares tonight. I'm not like weirded out about most things, but that worm picture got to me. I've seen a turkey hen leap five feet in the air to pull one off a tobacco plant. Maybe I have a new spirit animal. It's the turkey. So thank you, John, for that. I think we should get some turkeys out at Stratford to get those uh, suckers off of there. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> Jeff asks, how would one light a pipe before the convenience of matches or a lighter? A lot of it would be, so if we're in a tavern, there's a hearth and you'd have pieces of wood that are in the hearth and you would remove one and you would essentially just take the wood and, and light it from, from that. You'd light it from an existing fire or a candle or a gas light, but yeah, you'd be taking something, igniting it and using that smaller piece of wood, a piece of kindling, kindling um, in light. Flint. It. Yeah. Be the same flint thing too. going back to indigenous. We have within the, within the structure, whatever the structure is within that social group, we're going to have the fire and we're going to be around the fire talking, communicating. And within that, we're going to take something from the fire to light mm -hmm. some of the coals. Yeah. Amy, Amy chimes in, uh, tobacco tongs. <laughs> so yeah, little yeah, exactly, coals. Yeah. But yeah. There's a, you know, again, getting back to the material culture, there are so many rabbit holes in this topic, in every topic, but this one in particular, John asks, how prevalent was leveraging tobacco as currency? Was it primary a Southern thing? Was it solely based on weight or quality? Um, I know that, you know, tobacco was definitely mostly grown in the South, but I don't think that it stopped necessarily. I think it's thinned out as it went North. Do you know anything else about it that? Certainly, once again, it's very big in Connecticut to this day. You have this tobacco valley in Connecticut where 
you'll be like, oh, that's all tobacco. You know, you're used to seeing corn, you're used to seeing soybeans, and all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah. So, but yeah, I think that um, it's a great rabbit hole, once again, of really the currency of tobacco and where and when, uh, in what colonies, at what time periods did it really hold, you know, that gold? When, when did it, it set the gold standard? You know, so I'd, I'd be, that's certainly a rabbit hole I'd like to go further down. Definitely. Ooh, John David chimes in. I think, John David, aren't you the same one that gave us that great little turkey story just a second ago? There were planes designed to make um, curls of wood called spills for lighting pipes and from hearths oh. or lamps. Right on. Fantastic. Okay. Um, Trevor has a link here in the Q&A section. Um, it's a tobacco farm museum. That sounds fantastic in North Carolina. Thank you oh. for that. And then I think, let's see here, we're gonna have time for one more question and then we're gonna wrap it up. The last one is from Cynthia. Thinking about tobacco trade during the 18th century, how were these plants transported? Was it just the seeds or the entire plant? How did sailors, for example, keep these plants alive on ships until they reached their destination? So it was dried and then shipped, correct? Yeah, one thing I will say, so I've, I've grown tobacco here, I'm right outside uh, of Manhattan, right outside of New York City and um, it's absolutely incredible, and I, I have some in the other room, and I should have had them for the talk, I apologize. But really imagine a tablespoon of pepper that you'd find on a table, your own table, table to restaurant. That's really what tobacco seeds look like. And you've got the flowers come out, the leaves, and then these seed pods, and it's like a tiny little maraca, and you shake it. <laughs> There's hundreds of seeds, if not thousands, in each one of those seed pods. And it's so, it's, the number, I, I meant to write down the number, but the numbers are outrageous with how many acres you can populate from one tobacco, from the seeds from one tobacco plant. That uh. they're so small. It's absolutely unbelievable. So I, in my fantasy that when they were bringing that first tobacco plant back to Europe, I like to think that it made it all the way and, and they brought it into the court and it was alive. But if they didn't, <laughs> it would not be hard to have enough seeds to last really just about everyone in, in Spain could have their own tobacco plant if just one made it back, you know. <laughs> awesome. All right, and then John just ends it with, Justin, really appreciate the presentation this evening. Thank you, and thank you, Justin. This is the first, uh, thank you, Douglas. I'm very happy. You know, this COVID has been a very weird time. Uh, Stratford is in a very remote place in Virginia, and it's funny because it wasn't remote back during the colonial era. It was really ground zero for a lot of stuff, so it's kind of crazy how, you know, and Justin will be coming back at some point. I think it's in November. Let me see here. Um, your colonial maps on November 10th. We'll be talking about maps maybe you can talk a little bit about Stratford and how you know times have changed in terms of where it is and location and everything else but you know a lot of the programs that we've been doing actually all of them until recently have been in person and we really rely on people driving all the way to Stratford which is you know about 45 minutes off of 95 on the Potomac River I think it's a stunning place and it's I think that it's isolation really helps you think about history in a certain kind of way and sort of step back into that space um, but these Zoom talks that were forced on us by COVID, I think have been, you know, a real gift in that we're reaching people. I mean, we had someone last week from uh, Belfast this week. We had someone from Indonesia. Yes, Justin. So, yeah, you know, we're getting quite a few watchers of my science show, show who watch it in Indonesia were saying, hey, send us the Zoom link. I said, that's fantastic. I love it. And so, you know, we're getting people from California and from Texas and from Canada. And it's just a wonderful way to engage with the world, uh, to bring Stratford to the world, to bring this sort of, like I said, that textural history um, of the colonial era that people just forget. And it's, I think it's a nice way to lure people in. I want to invite you all to come back and cont to continue attending our lectures. This is so much fun. I love doing this every couple of weeks on a Tuesday. I'm like, it's Tuesday, you know, I'm going to have one of my colleagues on there. Let's do this. Our next one coming up is on September 22nd, and we have Dontavious Williams coming back. Fantastic. And just so you all know too, Justin here um, filmed all the stuff and helped us with the filming for the, the other cooking demonstrations and things. So he's definitely a part of the Stratford team, and it's always an honor to work with you, Justin. And this thank has been much. fantastic. And again, thank you to Virginia Humanities and to the Mars um, Wrigley Foundation. I think that you know we could not be doing these without your support and the support of all of you that Zoomed in tonight. So thank you all. And again, email me 
If you have any questions, it's kdeetz, K-D-E-E-T-Z, at stratfordhall.org, or you can get in touch with Justin Fornell on Instagram, and I will see you all in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Let me leave them with one little word. Yes. Uh, a word. So I know we mentioned this idea of doing a, a pipe and whiskey day at Stratford, and while I do love to talk and share stories, I, I love nothing more than meeting people in person, doing a fully immersive experience. There is a <laughs> word an extinct, almost extinct word in the English language, uh, which is lunting, L-U-N-T-I-N-G. And it is to walk about while smoking a pipe. Oh. So this is one of my favorite times of year as autumn is setting in, it's getting crisp. <laughs> and I hope we can all meet for an autumnal whiskey and lunt about the, um, <laughs> the space of Stratford Hall. At, uh, I <laughs> I absolutely love the idea of lunting about the grounds at Stratford. I mean, there's 2,000 acres to lunch around. Absolutely. Um, okay, hold on. There's a couple little things here, right here. The dates for the map are, the map talk is, and if you need one of these postcards sent, also email me and I will send you one. All of our programs are on here. They're also on our website. Uh, the pipe talk is November 10th. I'm sorry, the map talk is November 10th. Uh, Tom Dempsey says, a shameless plug for the Fredericksburg Pipe Society. Fantastic. That sounds great. Sounds like something that Justin should probably look into. Yeah. Um, John, the turkey guy, which, you, you know, I, you gave me my new hero, so thank you. A lot of thanks and all that. So, everybody, thank you so much, and we'll see you in two weeks. And what is, again, lunting? Lunting. So, everyone yeah, have yeah. A, a safe evening and a good lunt. <laughs> good, good night, everybody. Cheers.